Hi, my name is Avishai Anai, and I'm going to speak about PSI from Paxos, Fast Malicious Private Set Intersection. This is a joint work with my great co-authors, Benny Pinkas, Mike Rosalek, Nitri, and Nitriu. And I would also like to thank uh, Mike for the slides that he shared with me. So the problem of private set intersection, the basic problem has two parties, Alice and Bob, where Alice has a set of items and Bob has a set of items, such that they want to compute the intersection without having Alice reveal items that are not in the intersection that Bob has. And Bob reveals nothing about the items that Alice has that are not in the intersection. PSI has many applications in practice. For example, consider when you sign up to a new encrypted messaging application and you want to know who of your friends also uses the same application so you can communicate. You can do this using PSI without revealing to the application server the list of the uh, con phone contacts that you have. Another example shows how you can do, how you can check which of your passwords resides in lists of passwords of breaches. You can do that, you can do this without revealing to the server the list of your own passwords. Finally, Google and MasterCard collaborate in order to study the, eff the effect of online advertisements on offline purchases. In this uh, example, Google would input the list of people who watched some online advertisement, and MasterCard would input the list of people who uh, made a purchase offline using their credit card and the amount that they paid. And the result would be the aggregation of all amount paid by users who also watch the online advertisement. In, the, in that example, the result that the parties obtain is actually an aggregation, but not the content of the um, PSI, the, the intersection itself. But in our uh, protocol, we are actually interested in the content of the intersection. To put our protocol or our work in context, it's useful to see the map of state of the art PSI for uh, one, when run for one million items. This graph has two axes. The X axis is the runtime, so protocols uh, that are more on the left are faster. And the Y axis is the communication, so protocols that are lower are uh, lighter in communication. The state of their protocol in the semi honest uh, uh, setting is by Kolesnikov, Comerson, Rosalek, and Trio from 2016, which can process a million of items in about four seconds. If you look at uh, the dots of, for protocols that are secure in the malicious case, then the fastest protocol is by Rinal and Rosalek from 2017, which can process millions of items in about 15 seconds. So in this work, we're interested in closing the gap between the performance of malicious protocols and semi honest protocols. Specifically, if you compare this work to the prior state of the art of malicious, secu maliciously secure protocols, then our protocol is uh, about three times faster than the state of the art and requires uh, about 10 times less communication. If we compare this to the state of the art semi honest, then our protocol is only 25% slower and requires about double the communication. Asymptotically, this is also the first protocol that is based on uh, OT, uh, OT extension, which requires only linear uh, communication complexity in the number of items. This is concurrent to the work of uh, Josh and Nigel from last year that also achieved that asymptotics, but the protocol is not concretely efficient. In the rest of this talk, I'm going to address three main questions. The first one is what uh, makes those protocols for semi uh, honest, with semi honest security so efficient. Second is why the maliciously secure protocols are not that efficient. What is the challenge there? And third is how can we overcome the challenge? And specifically, I will also answer the question: What does the abbreviation of Paxos? The main building block in the state of the art protocols for private set intersection is called batched oblivious PRF or OPRF in short. 
in that uh, building block, we have Alice input for, for each entry, for each instance of Oblivious PRF, she inputs the value xi, this is her query. And the output is the evaluation of, of a pseudo-random function fi on xi for the instance i of the OPRF. So Alice obtains one pseudo-random function evaluation on her query, but Bob, on the other hand, obtains the pseudo-random function in its entirety. So Bob can compute the function fi on every input that he likes. The guarantees of Oblivious PRF is that Bob learns nothing about the uh, query of Alice, xi, and Alice learns nothing about uh, evaluation of the pseudo-random function on other inputs that she didn't query on. Batch Oblivious PRF is achieved very efficiently uh, from Oblivious Transfer Extension, and this is what makes the semi-honest protocol so efficient. So how does the KKRT protocol use batch oblivious PRF in order to achieve private set intersection protocol? In this example, we have uh, Alice has the items A, B, C, and D, and Bob has the items C, D, E, and F. And they are going to map their items into M beings, such that they agree on two hash functions, H1 and H2, and each item is going to be as, uh, associated with two positions of the bins. <clears throat> So Alice uh, can Alice associates the item A with the positions H1 of A and H2 of A, which are 2 and 7. She associates B with H1 of B and H2 of B, which are the positions 3 and 9, and so on. Bob does the same. But now we instruct Alice to choose only one position out of the two possible and place each item in that position. So Alice chooses A to be put in bin number two, and she uh, chooses B to be put in bin number nine, and so on. But Bob can't anticipate to which bin Alice would put her item. Therefore, Bob would put his items into both possible bins. So for example, C will be put in bins number three, and seven. D will be put in bins number D, uh, in bins number four, and seven, and so on. Now the parties are going to run the batch oblivious PRF, meaning that Alice would input for each for every bin the item that she puts in that bin. So for bin number two, Alice obtains F two of A. For bin number three, she obtains F three of C, and so on. On the other hand, Bob obtains the, the pseudorandom function entirely. He can evaluate those pseudorandom functions on every input. Specifically, he is going to send a message to Alice that uh, consists of many pseudorandom function evaluations. Basically, uh, there are two pseudorandom function evaluations for every item that Bob has. But let's look at uh, the message that Bob sends to Alice from top to bottom. bottom. <clears throat> so for bin number three, Bob would send the evaluation of F3 on C and also the evaluation of F3 on E because both C and E are mapped to bin number three. For bin number four, he will send only F4 on D <clears throat> and so on. Now, it is easy for Alice to conclude which items are in the intersection because those items leads to, to, uh, to the same pseudorandom um, value to appear in both the result of the oblivious PRF and in Bob message. So for item C, it will appear twice, first in F3C in the oblivious PRF and in uh, the message that Bob sent here. Similarly for item D. For items that, are not, uh, that do not appear twice, their value will look random to Alice. This is the guarantee that we have from the oblivious PRF. So why is that protocol not secure against malicious party, specifically against malicious Bob? Let's see what Bob can do. He should map C to both locations, three and seven, and also send both messages, F3 of C and F7 of C. 
However, what if you map C only to one location? Let's say you map C only to location, uh, only, only to Bing 3. Then there are two cases. The first one is that Alice maps C to Bing 3 as well. In that case, they will find that C is in the intersection. But on the other hand, if Alice maps C to Bing 7, then they will not find C in the intersection because the message F3C appears only once and the message F7C appears only once. So now in that uh, protocol, the decision of whether uh, to put uh, C in position three or seven is not isolated. Alice puts C in either th uh, being number three or seven. Th this decision depends on other items that Alice has. And therefore, whether C appears in the intersection or not may leak information on other items that Alice has. And therefore, we could not simulate the behavior of Bob in the ideal world. How do we overcome this problem? In the following, I'm going to show you a protocol that follows almost the same instructions, but in which Bob could not cheat in the way that I showed you uh, before. So first, we should use a, an OPRF billing block that is secure against malicious adversary. And fortunately, we have such a protocol by Orsini, Oru, and Scholl from 2017 with essentially the same cost as the semi-honest one. So we have a good start. Now, their protocol exposes some ad additive homomorphism property that is very important for our protocol. Specifically, if Alice obtains the pseudo-random evaluation of Fi on X and the pseudo-random evaluation of Fj on Y, she can XOR those two evaluations to obtain the evaluation of a combined function fij on the xor of x and y. And since Bob has fi and fj entirely, he can combine those functions to obtain fij and he can compute fij on every input that he wants. This is the important, the most important property that we are going to use in our protocol. Now, the main idea of our protocol is this. Alice is associ uh, associates the item A with two positions. In this example, it was two and seven. So she's going to secret share the item A into those two positions, meaning that she will put S2 and S7 in those positions such that S2X or S7 equals A. Similarly for, for B, which is associated with position three and nine, she will put S3 in position three and S9 in position nine, such that S3 X or S9 equals B. And she continue this way to, uh, for, for all of her items. From the homomorphism property, Alice can compute the evaluation of combined function. So for example, for item A, she can compute the uh, evaluation of the combined function F27 on A because F2 uh, on S2 X or F7 on S7 equals F27 on S2 X or S7, which equals A. And she does so for every item that she has. On the other hand, what Bob does, he takes every item that he has and finds the associated positions. So for example, for C, the associate position, associated positions are three and seven. And he first combines those two pseudorandom function. So he obtains F3, seven, and evaluate it on the value C. Similarly for D, he combines the two pseudorandom pseudo functions, F4 and F7, to obtain F4, seven, and evaluate it on the value D, and so on. And the result that Bob uh, obtains from this process uh, are sent to Alice. Now, similarly, as we did before, Alice check which values appear twice, and those uh, values represent the items that are in the intersection. 
in this example, f37 on c and f47 of d appear twice. Therefore, c and d are in the intersection. What's important here is that Bob could not input uh, some value halfway as he did in the semi-honest protocol of KKRT. Here, he either input an item or not. Now we are going to the question of how can Alice secret share all items such that there will not be conflicts? Specifically, Alice has to put uh, in the two positions of A, which are two and seven, a secret chair, secret, secret chairs such that their XOR equals A. And this constraint should hold for every item. The algorithm will start with a, an arbitrary position in the, uh, in the, in the uh, entries. For example, we start with bin number two, and the algorithm will put in bin number two some random value, S2. Then for every item for which one position is set and the other is unset, we can fix the unset position to fit the constraint. So, so here, to fit the constraint of item A, we should put in bin number seven, the value S7, such that S2 X or S7 equals A. Now, there is another item for which one position is set and the other is unset. This is C. This means that in bin number three, we should put S3 such that S3 X or S7 equals C. And then we continue with B. So we put S9 in the ninth bin and so on. For uh, items for which both positions are unset, we can choose one arbitrarily and then fix the other according to the constraint. This algorithm does not work in general because it is guaranteed to work only if the graph induced by the constraints of the items is acyclic. This graph is called a cuckoo graph, such that each position of the vector S is a ver uh, vertex and the edges induced by the constraints. So A induces uh, an edge between S2 and S and S7. These are the two positions that are associated with A. To solve this problem, we'll look at this problem of, of, of solving these uh, linear constraints in a more abstract way. Specifically, we look at it as an encoding problem. We have a set of items. Each of them has some constraint that we want to satisfy by uh, an XOR operation, such that all positions, specifically here, we have only two positions. So the positions with associated with item X, which are uh, the values SH1 of X and SH2 of X, the XOR of them should be equal X. If we generalize this even more, then we can associate with each item more than two positions. So all values in the positions associated with X, the XOR of them should, should be equal X. This is the uh, basic requirements uh, in this, for, for solving this problem. Therefore, we call this uh, kind of data structure that we, that we um, introduce probe and XOR of strings. Now, this data structure has several requirements. The first one is that it should be satisfiable. All constraints should be satisfiable with overwhelming probability. This requirement is important so that our PSI protocol would not fail at least, uh, 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 except with negligible probability. Second, we want the size of the data structure, the number of, uh, of elements in the vector S to be as small as possible, because this number implies the, nu the number of OPRF instances that we will be use, using in, in the PSI protocol. Third, we want the runtime of the encoding algorithm to be uh, linear in the number of items. There are several possibilities to uh, realize that data structure. One of them is, as I showed you before, using uh, by associating two positions with each item and then running the algorithm that I showed you before. However, the failure probability would be too high in order 
to be used in our PSI protocol. Therefore, it is not good enough. The second possibility, in the second possibility, we'll uh, associate a position in the vector S. Each position will be associated with an item with probability one half. Therefore, we'll get <coughs> a random linear system of constraints such that if the number of, of uh, if the size of the vector s is a little bit more larger than the number of constraints then we'll have a solution with high probability but to obtain the solution to compute it it would be too expensive it would be cubic in the number of, of, of uh, constraints another realization of the paxos data structure is called garble bloom filter which which associates with each item lambda positions. And unfortunately, the size of the vector S would be lambda times the number of items. Finally, in this work, we propose a new realization, which we call garbled cuckoo tables, which maps the n items to a, a, a vector of linear size with a very small constant of 2.4. And also, the encoding algorithm is very fast. It is linear in the number of items. How does it work? So we start with the same idea that, we, that I mentioned before. Each item is associated with two positions, h1 of x and h2 of x. But as I mentioned, there is a problem. There might be cycles. Uh, so how can we solve that problem? The idea is to extend the vector s with k auxiliary positions. And now we accept the two positions that are associated with, it, with each item. We associate additional random collection of positions from the auxiliary positions with each item. Now we get a system which can be solvable with high probability. But we, we don't want to solve the entire system using uh, Gaussian elimination, which takes cubic time. We want to do something more efficient. So our idea is to first identify all items that appear on cycles and to identify the graph that induced by them. This graph implies a, a, a system of linear uh, constraints, which we can solve in the hard way using Gaussian elimination. The idea is that if the uh, number of variables here is greater a little bit than the number of constraints, for example, specifically here, if k is greater than uh, the cycle of items plus lambda, then with high probability we'll have a solution. And if we have a solution, we can compute it using the Gaussian elimination in cubic time. But note that this will be cubic only in the number of items on cycles and not in the total number of items. Now we can solve for the remaining items iteratively, as I said before, to uh, such that for each item we look for the unset uh, position and fix that position to satisfy the requirements. Now, if we can play with the parameters of, of this construction, we can achieve that uh, the number of cycle items is only logarithmic in the, in the total number of items and therefore solving the uh, linear system using the Gaussian elimination would not be too, uh, too expensive. To summarize, I've shown you a new approach for malicious private set intersection, which is the fastest to date and almost closes the gap between malicious and semi-honest performance. And along the line, I have introduced a new data structure called probe and XOR of strings, or Paxos in short, and showed how it can be achieved with linear size and linear complexity. Thank you for listening and hope to see you face to face in the next conference.